Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Leo Linnaerts of uh, ARC Nature Foundation. And um, my talk is about grazing animals as ecosystem resource. And I uh, will talk about, uh, more specifically, about two nature reserves in the Netherlands. Not very big, but showing uh, some nice examples of rewilding. Um, the way we look at, uh, well, restoring and rewilding is uh, it's actually reintroducing once lost herbivores. And uh, that's restoring the co-evolution of landscape, plants, and animals. So we think of it uh, as not we bring back an animal as a, a relic of the past. No, we restore the co-evolution, which is quite a different thing. And uh, you see some nice examples of uh, you know, the, the plants, the seeds sticking to the hair. You see this one, the cattle egret. is not about cattle all the time. It uses deer, and this is a deer species in Africa. Uh, the white stork uh, loves to, uh, uh, to feed among grazers. And uh, you see the starlings here. They <clears throat> also love the grazing. So you have a lot of interactions of plants, herbivores, and all other species. Um, and if you look into history, you can see at the various cave paintings in Spain and in France, that we had an uh, well, enormous diversity of herbivores, ranging from very big, as the straight tusk elephant, to smaller ones like the beaver. And uh, yeah, and we had, of course, the, uh, the giant deer, the uh, bison, the auroch, etc., and two types of rhinoceros. Um, but they disappeared. And we let them disappear. And if you look at a worldwide scale, this is a, uh, a publication in uh, Penas. You see the current distribution, like the biggest one, only in southern Africa and in uh, Southeast Asia, and still shrinking, still declining. Uh, uh, the medium-sized herbivores, they're doing a little bit better. And the carnivores are, st um, are still there. But if you look to the... Um, well, where they were once present, that was a bit different uh, story. And of course, this is not only uh, elephants, but it's giant thos, etc. But it, uh, it is about the very, very big herbivores having a big impact on the landscape. Um, so, where are we then uh, in Europe with uh, all this uh, uh, herbivores taken away, and uh, especially if you look to the Netherlands, uh, there was a time in the 18th century, 19th century, where we have had lost all our herbivores. Wild boar was gone. Red deer was gone. And they were br uh, brought back by the noblemen because they wanted to shoot them. And that's the only reason why we have wild boar in the Netherlands and red deer in the Netherlands, because it was a nice hunting game. Um, but if you look on the broader scale, we still have this, all these grazing animals that once used to roam Europe, we still have them. We even have water buffalo, because the same species is still living in India in a wild state, and we still have them as domestic ones. As we do aurok and wild horse, they live as a domesticated animal still. So what we can do, is we had this situation once in the past where everything was intertwined, where the herbivores, the predators, man as a big predator, was present in the landscape and was governed by the landscape. No herbivores to hunt, starvation. No plants to eat, starvation. So it was all intertwined. And then, once upon a time, we left the Garden of Eden and we started cultivating the land. Um, and then we know what happens with intensive farming and, and where nature conservation went somewhere, or well, nature went down the drain. And what we want to do is to, to re-intertwine all these processes. We want to bring plants and herbivores back together. We want to bring herbivores and predators back together. And not only, you know, the tiny ones, the grasshoppers and the tiny flowers, I mean, the big ones as well, the trees and the... Uh, the auroch and the bison, etc. And we want to have to, uh, again, as was in the past, we want to have this, um, well, this co-evolution of species and landscape. So, 
if you want to do that, you raise the question, what natu natural processes and key species do you need for this restoration? Because um, should we bring back bison? Is fire enough? Do we have uh, high water tables, is that enough? Or do we need all of that? So what do we need? If we look into detail for uh, herbivores, we see that they facilitate each other. It's no, not a thing that you have one herbivore and he does it all. No, in areas like this, the floodplain area, we see that cattle graze the grass shorter, um, the, the, the tall grass they graze shorter, then the horses come in because they like the somewhat shorter grass and they make it even shorter. Then when the horses have shortened the grass, the geese come in because they like the really short grass or the rabbits or whatever. And uh, so you get this facilitation along the line. And um, if you look into the sandy soil um, areas where the Kranzflak is a dune area and the Masos is an inland sand area, uh, you see this facilitation that Bison um, is opening up the shrubbery. And he is uh, eating down the tall grass to middle-sized grass, facilitating horse and fallow deer. And horse also facilitates fallow deer and both facilitate rabbit and the vegetation shrinks. And now that's bad news if you would talk about, you know, uh, the whole area go into the same uh, succession, the same shortening, uh, shrinking of all the shrubberies and, you know, grass, and then you have only have a grazing lawn. That's bad news <clears throat> because you would end up with only rabbits. Now the funny thing is that you have this mixture of shrubbery that is not so very tasty, that's not eaten. You have very tasty shrubbery, that's eaten. And you have uh, uh, grass that is really nice and grass that is not really nice. So, so you get this patchy vegetation. Where, and you, when, you, uh, when I visited that area 10 years ago, just before the bison came, there was this uh, total shrubbery recovery with one grass species below. That was it, a two species. Um, ecosystem on spots, you know, not, not the whole site, but on certain spots. Then the bison came and thought, ah, that's a tasty shrubbery. So they ate it all, literally all. Um, so actually you see here all the broken branches. This is just before it fell down completely. If you look now, different kinds of shrubbery are popping up. Some are already in between. The grass is uh, uh, shortened, but where there were stumps of, uh, uh, of dead shrubberies, uh, dead wood, the grass is much taller. And then you see these grazing lawns uh, and the intermediate side with loads of flowers. And if you look down now, you would uh, uh, see at least 100 species of flowers. You would see many insects. You would see, when you enter the area, you would see birds flying away because they had been feeding there or they are breeding in the very dense shrubberies there. So there's a lot of you know, biodiversity increase. And that is what we see. Um, so that's facilitation. But on the other end, as I was telling, if you have on a large scale, um, well, the bison is taking down the shrubbery, and the horses eat down the grass even shorter, and then it's shorter, shorter, shorter. Then in the end, you end up in a situation where the tallest one is uh, at a high population level and is eating all the short grass and the grass is not, there's not enough grass for the bison to eat. So as the big ones uh, ate the smaller ones in surviving, the moment you have a lot of little ones, they start competing the other way around and they start pushing the other ones out. Um, so there needs to be a kind of balance in there. Um, Good, and then if we, um, well, we have been uh, seeing a lot of trees and tree generation, a lot of talks were about trees and was the landscape open or not. We see that many herbivores, let's say all herbivores, eat trees and bushes. They love the taste of leaves, they love the taste of bark, and they eat them. And uh, here's three examples, bison, water buffalo, and, uh, and wild horse, conic horse. So, and this is what might happen to your plantation. If you put in um, conic horses in, 
uh, Highland cattle. And, um, well, these Canadian poplars were really tasty, so they all disappeared. <laughs> oh, no, my forest is gone. No, it's not. Like at Nap, the forest opens up, you get the grassland full of flowers, and then once there is enough sun, enough sunlight, the bramble start popping up. Here and there, patchy, some are eaten, some are slowly grown, and when they are big enough, then you get all kinds of tree, trees. You know, the, the, the seeds get blown in, and uh, they're not grazed because the, the grazers can't reach them, and so you get this nice little islands, like this one here. This is in a grazed area in the Netherlands. You wouldn't tell because the grass is really tall, um, but that's because there's a lack of horses here and the cattle don't feed on this kind of grass. Um, but anyway, the cattle do graze on the willows. So if they could reach those willows, there were a history in the willows. But because this is uh, uh, um, um, this June, uh, really, really nasty thing, uh, with large spines. <laughs> sea buckthorn, thank you. Uh, you ever walked through sea buckthorn? You'll never forget it. No matter how strong your trousers are, it's penetrating. You have to have a thick, thick, thick leather uh, well, uh, trousers in order to not be penetrated by these huge thorns. They're awful. Uh, I hate them. And so do all the herbivores. So if they're not starving, they leave these tasty willows alone. And you see that in the middle of the bush, like Franz Vera said, it starts with a tiny bush and it grows outside with the root system and always new ones popping up. These ones in the middle are older and towards the sides you have younger ones. So you have difference in age. Um, an example of uh, oak, in, uh, like we see yesterday, rose and bramble. Uh, and here is uh, uh, elm, and uh, it's again sea buckthorn. So there's um, a lot of uh, you know thorns protect the uh, regeneration of trees, but also the large herbivores facilitate uh, germination. Like Franz said, here is a place where they kicked away the moss, uh, and uh, where trees could germinate. This, however, is not done by a large herbivore, but it's mice uh, that do transport like this. They, I've never seen a cow with a, um, <clears throat> a big seed in its mouth and putting it in the ground and doing like this. It's, mice do that, and squirrels. Um, but by, uh, by, eat, by eating the grass shorter, uh, making openings in, uh, you get the light demanding species, you give them opportunity to grow from seed to a tiny tree. And of course they get eaten a lot, but uh, uh, otherwise the uh, grass would be this high and all the seedlings would die because they don't get enough light. So they uh, are, are shaded. And you see, you know, next to thorn bushes, uh, there's a lot of regrowth. Um, when you have the, um, the wood pasture cycle on sandy soil, if you have no grazing animals, you get this really short cycle. You have this closed canopy forest in some area. Well, can anything can happen. Age, storm, fire, uh, uh, a tree disease killing all the trees. And you have this gap area, very nice. When you have no grazing animals, within you know, 10 years, you've got closed canopy again, because there's many, many young trees. And although they are not very tall, it's closing up very, very quickly and high competition of shadow uh, tolerant species and quick growth. The quicker you can grow, the more you can outcompete the others, which leaves only a few winners. And this is a species poor cycle. But if you have grazing animals, something else happens. You get openness, you get grass, you get, uh, and the grass is eaten and uh, uh, Germination of young trees is uh, prohibited, they are kept low. Uh, you need the thorny bushes to pop in and you get, well, the grazed landscape. So succession is never linear, but it's 
of uh, uh, linear, but circular, and you can have all kinds of shortcuts from one stage to another. So I leave out the shadow part and I put in the grazing animals. And you see that uh, if you go from all these places, you see that in, when the forest canopy closes, there's little to eat for the animals. So they use these parts for resting and then they nibble a bit on the, uh, on the young trees that are trying to grow up there. Uh, but it's not that much happening. And then um, if an o they know an opening, they'll move there to feed. And uh, so the density of herbivores in the open areas, whenever, even if they are large or smaller, it doesn't matter, they'll be there. When they want to feed, they'll feed in the open. And if you, say for instance, uh, bison is told as a forest animal, if you give them the choice, they eat grass. And then uh, in winter time and spring time and a little bit in summer, they eat leaves and bark and stuff like that. But mainly they love to feed here. And even, you know, leaves, you, you can't eat leaves here. There are no leaves for you to eat. They're all high up in the canopy. You can't reach them. You can only eat bark. And there's no species her of herbivore I know of that only lives off bark. It's, I don't know them. So you do have, uh, you do need these open gaps for all these species to survive. <laughs> what we also see is that um, the abiotic and biotic processes cooperate. You have these, uh, this tree here toppled by a storm, and you see all this debarking by uh, highland cattle in this case. So, well, uh, preventing the tree from regrowing, actually. So now you have your gap. Otherwise, you would have had a tree, and you would have uh, tens of stems going to the sky. Now you have nothing, maybe one branch will survive. Um, here there was uh, fire, and the fire uh, weakens the tree, and you get this tree bark beetle eating it up. Here you had the barking uh, bison, and then this mushroom came in and starts eating the tree. So you, had a lot, you have a lot of cooperation. Once you have your forest opened up, it's going to look like this. Instead of shadow with no flowers, you get flowers. You get bushes flowering, you get uh, the flowers, the herbs flowering. And of course, you get many insects and uh, you get your ecosystem you know, rocketing. Um, so what we see actually is that wind, water, and fire uh, act on a huge area uh, in more or less the same way. But the herbivores have many small-scale effects. You know, they eat here, small scale. Uh, they, they take a sand bath, they, they shit there. and So you have a lot of uh, small-scale effects. One of these effects is uh, taking a sand bath. Uh, no, uh, horses do, bison do. And you get areas like this, these sand pits and pioneer plants. They really profit from that. And then... Uh, with the cattle, if you have multiple bulls, they start competing to each other. And one way of competing is digging a, a bull pit. And that's, uh, uh, they use their legs, their front legs, and their horns, and their head to make really nice holes. And the one with the biggest hole is the winner. <laughs> and then you think, yeah, yeah, that's one pit. This is Google Maps, you know, satellite picture from Google. And this is a grazing area. There's many bulls there. All these, these white patches here are bull pits. So only this one is by flooding of the water there. But all the other ones here are on dry land, and they are bull pits. And they are all interconnected with um, um, uh, the, the, the uh, walkways of the animals. So this is an ecological network allowing these pioneer plants to survive, to hop from one pit to the other one. If a pit is overused and has no vegetation at all, it gets recolonized by, uh, from the other pits. And the animals moving from pit to pit travel with the seeds. So you get a very effective um, ecological network for these pioneer plants. And the area is, well, the total area is less than 1% of the 
uh, of it all. Okay, let's move to the Kahn's flock area. 10 years of bison, natural grazing. Of course, bison, you can't put them in a fence, small fence, and treat them. So if you do it to do everything, you have to uh, dart them. Uh, so put them asleep, treat them, uh, and then you can wake them up and they go off. You can't put them in a corral and say, hello, I'm Leo, and I want to tag your ears. <laughs> That's not a wise idea. Um, we, uh, have, we think we, they need natural water, natural drinking water, natural herd composition being very important. Um, room for social processes, also very important. Um, and then they need no additional food, no additional shelter, and no neglect either. So we do treat them when necessary but they do find their own food in winter. They only need a small fence, one meter 20, the same as your horse does. Um, we have bison, conic horses, highland cattle, fallow deer and roe deer and rabbits in the same area. The magpie acts as a European oxpecker. <laughs> don't forget that one. If you don't have your magpies, they have much more ticks and they use the magpies to, for the areas where they can't rub properly. Um, they create massive amount of pioneer patches, all interconnected, and lots of animals and plants profit, like the sand lizard, etc. Then they all take, well, they travel with seeds a lot, they disperse them, and you see this little movie, all the beetles going in and out the dung, and they're the dung beetles, there's a massive amount of dung beetles if you don't use any medicine. In the Maasvorst, we're trying to restore grazing in 1,500 hectares. And we see that bison feeds on a broad range of uh, grasses, including more grass. They break birch and bird cherry, which is an invasive species in uh, continental Europe. And, uh, of course, uh, top reuse of sand pits. The Exmo pony also feeds heavily on more grass, which is a real bonus. And if you put them with bison together, they use up a larger area, and, uh, but the bison is dominant. The aurochs, they don't eat more grass. They hate it, and they eat all the other grasses first. And they depend on bison or horse to eat the old more grass, so they can feed on the fresh regrowth, which is the only thing they eat of more grass. So like a facilitation, you need the other species to, uh, uh, to have them together. We don't have them together in the, the Maasvos yet, but we are planning to. Um, wilderness nature. Many people go there hiking, biking, so there's not, you know, it is not a fenced off area and nobody can go there, no. It's a lot of human use there. And you see this, um, so there's a lot of interaction. There's risks going with it. Uh, people can come very close. You have these places, I guess in Britain as well, where you can go and can pet goats and cows and sheep and whatever. You totally learn the wrong thing. Because most enemies, and especially bison, <laughs> they hate being touched. It's like, it's really indecent if you do so. <laughs> it's only a mother touches her calf. And maybe when she's covered just before that, she's touched by the bull. But if a bison touches another bison, it's, it's you know, they're fighting. <laughs> they don't accept it, so don't try that. Um, well, if you make a circle around an animal or a group of animals, they feel threatened very much. So they really will react, whether it are horses, whether it are wild cattle, and especially for wild animals as red deer and bison, and even fallow deer. They, they don't like being encircled, which is really threatening. Um, so how do, how do we act with all this public? We have clear rules for them. Uh, uh, we have intensive public awareness program and education. We do a lot of excursions on foot, on bike and on horseback, and uh, we do remove all animals that have shown misbehavior towards people. Because this behavior can be copied, and as it is quite effective 
in chasing of people. Um, it's like, a, you know, the other animals see, ah, I have a bonus. <laughs> when I grab one of these two legs, they don't bother me anymore. So, yeah, we, ha we have to. <laughs> we have to. And then you end up like here with the longhorn cattle that you can do can walk among the bison. You see my little daughter. That was a year ago. And uh, she loves the bison. And uh, we can just come quite close. And uh, like here, horseback riding, no problem at all. So please do come and visit us and uh, look for yourself, see and experience the bison and the wild cattle and the wild horses in the Netherlands. Thank you. So Leo, um, my question is about natural processes and a, a lack of uh, and I'm um, Jill Butler. Um, and uh, what we actually mean by natural processes, and we've had an example from David where the Scottish, uh, a Scottish site was planting trees, um, and that's called wild carafren. Um, and now you're talking about bison. I mean, if we talked about a scale of one to ten. Um, you know, could, could we sort of uh, put some of these natural processes on that scale? And I think I've heard Franz talk about um, what we're trying to do is always push up the scale. Am I right in understanding that? We're always trying to push in, in a higher direction and increase diversity as much as possible. Yeah. Well, it's... Um it's not an easy to answer question. Yes, we do try to push up the skill, but any natural process that you, uh, you put in uh, will increase the skill. So if you restore your natural water system, then you push up the skill. If you uh, introduce uh, several herbivores, uh, wild living herbivores, you push up the skill. But if you have, for instance, only summer grazing, that's a little bit pushing up, but if you have then uh, um, uh, well, natural herd composition, like I told with the bulls, and they act different and, as the cows, uh, and in bison, uh, you have a really wild animal, you can't say the animals you know, go there and eat that, they, 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 they just don't want to be uh, steered, so it's very difficult with a wild animal. Uh, they do their own thing, so that's pushing up even more the scale. Uh, but when you're already at, say, seven on the scale, and you introduce a wild animal like uh, the bison, you go to eight. But if you're only, you know, down there at one, and you introduce bison, you, know, you go a little bit up. So it's, you go from one to two. Uh, so it's not, you know, you can't tell, if I go, I go for bison, I'll be at seven. Uh, it's, it's more like you pushing up the scale every time a little bit. And if you put bison in a small area, like 50 hectares, you're not pushing up anything. You're just, you know, <laughs> you have a meadow <laughs> and it's being grazed. And it's not very far from agriculture use because these small herds need probably additional feeding. And uh, there's a lot of intervention. Uh, you taking bulls out and new bulls in to, uh, to prevent inbreeding, etc., etc. So the bigger the scale, the more you let uh, the animals do the, their own thing, uh, and you have multiple bulls uh, uh, and uh, many, many cows, and so you have this social structure and social sy system which by itself prevents inbreeding. They have their own social ways of preventing inbreeding because we were not preventing inbreeding when we were hunting them uh, uh, with our spears. Now, it's in the old days, we, uh, we didn't do that. Nowadays, we do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.